I can't take anymore. It's so funny too, how you're seeing all of these um, side-by-side -side photos of the rainbow logos here. And then every single one in the Middle East, you won't see any rainbows there. Yeah. Yeah, also, absolutely. It's interesting how all of these corporations suddenly take a stand now that we don't need them to, now that it's yeah. accepted and it's the norm. Where were they yeah. in the 1980s when people were dropping dead? I didn't see any rainbow yeah. logos then. Did you? No. Yeah, welcome back to the channel, everybody. Um, you know it's June. We are about... The first we're through the first week in June, and I, for one, am probably ready to, for it to be over with. Um, but we also know it's Pride Month, so I thought, who better to come on and talk some of the issues and controversies and everything like that surrounding the LGBT community than my friend Mike Harlow, um, who we hey. met we met on Twitter, and I found you because of the Walk Away movement. And we've met up a couple times too, which was which is really awesome when you were down here in Atlanta. Yeah, that was awesome. We did, I think, like two or three different things around there. Yeah, I know. Well, the it first one, so I was like, you. I think I saw your, what's that? It was so great to meet you. Oh, I know. It's, it was, it, I was like, we had talked so much and you had just been banned off Twitter at the time. <laughs> so I, I saw your Instagram story and I'm like, wait, you guys were in Atlanta? What's going on? And then I, I went to the event and that's was the first time I met you. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I'm so happy to be here. If you guys, if you guys don't know, Mikey gives the best hugs in the world. I would <laughs> tell everybody that. <laughs> You're the best. Yeah, I'm like, you know, people are bad with names, but good with faces. I'm the opposite. I'm good with names, but nothing else for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm so I told people, names. you don't do that. I'm like, tell me your name when you meet me. <laughs> so. But no, oh my God, though. I totally agree with you. I'm like, I, I've already reached my quota and then some would. Pride yeah. Month. I'm, I'm just like not even used to the fact that it's a damn month now. And it's not just a month, by the way, because there are all these other things. It's like multiple months. Then there's like yeah. all other days and stuff. There's stuff in October. There's stuff in November. It's like Bisexuality Week and Trans Awareness Day and Trans Remembrance Day and Trans whatever. Enough. Yeah, I mean... And then they can't even give lesbians their own day. They have to add trans people into no. their day. <laughs> That's so true. I didn't even think of that. Um, but More it is. I mean, it's like time. every other thing. And you know, you know, Atlanta, our pride is actually in October um, because it co it's the largest that coincides with International Coming Out Day. Oh, great. Another day. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever have... I don't know if we're the same age or anything or if they still have this, but when I was in high school, they used to have the day of silence. Did you ever have that? No. Uh, I think I'm a little bit I think I'm a little bit older than day you. Of silence. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm actually a little bit older than you. Uh, because I think I mean I graduated in 05, so it still wasn't super popular to be be gay at the time. It wasn't then either, but they were sort of trying to like. I don't know, Jason, but it was just this one day called the Day of Silence where everyone had to either not speak or wear tape over their mouths and everyone would just not speak. So every year I would get in trouble because I would just run my mouth and start laughing and thought it was yeah. so stupid. And, I, and of course, you weren't supposed to ask questions about it. So I'd be the one raising my hand being like, wait, so you want people to talk about these issues. So how does silence do that? And they were like, what? Get out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's that's the way it is, though, right? You always question the establishment. Yeah. They, they they don't want to acknowledge anything. <laughs> you know, it's it's they rather silence you than um, than have a conversation about it. And now it, those that same stuff is coming into everyday life. Like how many times have you been uh, banned from uh, Facebook so far? Oh, God. <laughs> seven eight nine ten i don't know i'm on another ban this time for a month uh i've been permanently banned from twitter three times i could i they didn't get the first two to stick but then i finally just made a new one so follow me on twitter not mike harlow because like 
they i'm just back at square one so i feel like it's just me like screaming into an empty room and no one cares yeah (laughs) yes and retweet your stuff too because it's great Uh, um but i I know a lot of people it's hard to rebuild um after you've been 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 sent down because people are like wait where where's this person at and then they don't realize you have another account and so it just takes time to get that but it's because you've been on silent right (laughs) yeah well, the problem is we've all just gotten so used to this censorship. We're just like frogs being brought up to a boil where, I mean, some of us remember there was once a time years ago where people would care when someone got banned from stuff, but that's no longer the case because it's so common. Walkaway got their entire platform taken away from the Facebook group and Instagram, a bunch of stuff. Um, so they're, what they're working on doing is trying to... Um, or not trying, but they're working right now on building their own separate independent platform that's going to be launching soon. So okay. trying to do something to actually be about action, because that's a big problem with our people is like, it's all talk, 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 and they don't really like to do much. So no, you're up. Yeah, you're right. It's people you always hear people saying, I agree with you behind the scenes, but then they never get out there publicly and start speaking speaking what they feel you know speaking the truth because they're afraid of the woke mobs and everything like that which the walk away was a movement that it just went in the face of that and it kind of started bringing even more people out i mean you guys did a lot of good with the walk away movement well thank you yeah i think so um we're gonna do a lot more we're not gonna let this stop us but absolutely it's been sort of a building year i think for everyone i mean i think uh, you know, I think in terms of like the elections, because we're traveling so much doing events at, at least once a week um, in different cities. And I think this could not, the election, everything, this could not have possibly gone worse. There's, unless maybe the earth blew up, that's the only way things could have <laughs> gone more disastrously. Like, I don't know, I would have just so yeah. much rather seen it be a total landslide for Biden, unquestionably, because at least then it would be like, okay, well, let's look at where we dropped the ball and we did, but this result has just been very, uh, it's been a tough pill to swallow. Yeah, and I've said this on, I think, my last two streams that I've done. It's interesting to see what happened in the aftermath of the election and everything like that and where people, where, where things have started to go because when you look at the election results um, and you look at the percentages and when they look at, you know, demographics, Donald Trump gained in the lgbt community he gained in the black community he gained in the hispanic community heavily in florida um i mean he gained in every single category besides white men which Mm -hmm. should show people where the democrats are right now if that's the people that are coming out for them but it should also but now you're also starting to see it should also show the gop who their supporters were in this election but then now the social conservatives are coming out and actively pushing people like you away and don't even want your movement that brought so many people to the party. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. It, uh, yeah, it, it's, you know, I feel like in many ways, walk away and people like us have sort of been doing, uh, you know, we've sort of had to pick up the slack for like 30 years of neglect from the Republican party, not just in terms of, in terms of so many different groups of people, the black community, so many different ways, they've really just kind of done nothing for so many years. Um, So I think we've just been trying to like be about action in their absence, having no help of course, from the Republican party. Um, A lot of them, it's, it's like they like losing. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. That is true. And now, and I come from, I'm a libertarian, and I actually voted for Joe Jorgensen in the election. But that's what I like. About, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I liked about the, the walk away movement. I think there's a lot of misconceptions about it uh, in the liberty com- community, too, because, I mean, Brandon even said, this is not a MAGA movement. This is a we left the left movement. And, but a lot of people looked at it as a MAGA movement. Yeah. And I will, and I think that you're going to see that, especially in the future of Walkaway, is that um, we have all different views on what should happen moving forward uh, in terms of the Republican Party and who runs and stuff like that. Like for me, I feel very, very strongly that I 
pray to God that Trump will not run again. I love him. I wish to God that he were still president. Um, it's horrible what happened with the election and stuff. And I think he should be an amazing leader from the sidelines. But you can't ignore all of the mistakes that were made, which just drive me crazy. Like yeah. so many things that happened, I mean, that were so preventable. And that's what I mean when I say I, a lot of these people, I think it's like they would rather be right than win. It's like they like losing. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and th yeah, they don't know how to win. It's like, I'm like, how are you pushing people away when you just lost the election? And whatever you think about that, I think people just need to realize that the Trump administration never, they never showed enough proof that there was enough voter fraud to overturn the results. I, there just was never enough proof. Well, it's an ongoing problem with him is that uh, even back, because I didn't vote for him in 2016 and then I did in 2020, but even back from when he first entered office, one of my biggest problems with him is the people around him, the people that he hires are yeah. so terrible. Um, and in terms of fighting the election, we needed real serious people handling this, not mm -hmm. Giuliani, who, you know, he was a great <laughs> mayor years ago when I was a kid, but God, he's way the hell past his prime. Um, and I think, you know, if you look at the Time Magazine article that came out, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but a couple months ago, there was this big Time Magazine piece that admitted what we all knew about, they literally said this shadow, this cabal of shadowy figures working to change laws, control the flow of information, all this other stuff. And my big takeaway from that was where were Republicans? Like these people were allowed to do this. So you have to, the, the fight to be had was months beforehand, before the election, oh, yes. when all of these local munis municipalities were working to change laws. And I mean, I don't know where the hell my party was at that time. It, it just doesn't, it's not effective to allow the game to be rigged and then complain about the outcome at the end. Which, yeah, yeah, it sucks, it's horrible, but you guys are the ones who let this happen. We all knew they were gonna cheat. We were talking about it for months and months and months. And the fact that there was no plan and no strategy, it, it, that's a really Absolutely. tough pill to swallow for me. Yeah, I mean, I spoke with, I actually did a live stream with Ryan Graham, who is the chair of the Libertarian Party of Georgia. Um, oh. And he, he was one of the ones that was, um, they were pushing against the Dominion voting system about being allowed to use it before, well before the election. They knew wow. that the risks. So nobody was pushing it to the media. Nobody was out there saying, hey, this system shouldn't be used. And this is why, why you know, all the, the flaws about it, because it's not a good system um, and, and it's not great for election security. And so I said, when I watched a video where a poll worker was allowed to go in there and change a vote or add a vote um, without any sort of, and they didn't even tell which poll worker it was, they could just do it, um, you know, as a correction. It, it really looked really fishy in, in the system. I was like, um, how are you able to do that? It, like, it should never be like that. And, and, and that's where the problem is, is it's almost inaudible. You can't audit that type of result because that's how the system's made so that it, it looks legit. And, and the problem is that um, on every level, all of these positions are filled with Democrats because at this point, it's like, there have been so many years and decades of neglect that like, where do we even go from here? I mean, we're starting at step 100 trying to catch up to Democrats. I mean, where the hell are the Republicans? I remember years ago when I hated Republicans and I was a Democrat, like if you think back to the Bush era and the 2000 election, mm -hmm. I remember thinking that these Republicans would just mow people down and get what they want. I'm like, where are those people? Like they were <laughs> evil and had horrible policies, but God, if we could somehow combine their competence with Trump's policies would be unstoppable. Yeah, the biggest issue, because um, I grew up conservative. Um, my whole life I've been conservative, grew up conservative family. And I'm so I have a, di a little bit different path um, than most of you guys in the walk away movement, because I never actually walked away from the left. In fact, I went from conservative um, and then to a Ron Paul supporter oh, wow. and then to full libertarian because the only reason why I didn't like Ron Paul was his foreign policy. And so 
I've kind of moved over into the social, social libertarian aspect as well. And um, so growing up, I, vo- I mean, I voted for Romney and McCain. Um, I think the issue is they were so focused on um, pulling Democrats and independents over that they, that they, they were trying to, they were, they were starting to pander and that's where they went wrong is they stopped being the party of old and they started pandering to independents and leftists. They didn't realize that it's, it's conservative values that, that really got what they, you know, got them where they were. It's small government principles because we've seen the, we've just seen the shift in the parties. The, the left has gone extreme left and the, uh, the right has moved over left as well. And I think that's evident right now because you're seeing Donald Trump was a, was mostly a lifelong Democrat. And now, um, you know, Vernon Jones is running for governor and in Georgia. So. Yeah. And and, and he's, and he was, he, he came over to the right. I know I saw him at the walk. He was a speaker a lot of times with you guys. So. That's what people forget is that in 2016, um, it was something like 10 to 12 million Obama voters voted for Trump. So uh, it in many ways was walkaway voters who put Trump in office. Um, yeah. This time in 2020, by their own count, he got about 10 million more votes than he did in 2016. So, you know, that's uh, like that's just very, I don't know, because as somebody who traveled so much and put so much work in and went to the White House and you know, I live in New York City, blue as hell. And over that summer and that fall, whenever I would wear my Trump hat, just to the grocery store, wherever, I could not leave my house with it without a dozen different people coming up to me, high-fiving me, saying, hell yeah. So to feel yeah. that momentum and feel the unprecedented level of support that was out there for President Trump across every group of people, for this to be the result is, you know... Yeah. But oh, you know, yeah, we absolutely. have to move forward. Um, I don't know. For me personally, I wonder about how if they don't fix these things. And I mean, it seems like they, you know, there are a couple bills here and there, with, but it seems like there hasn't been this like huge effort to change the system in the Republican Party. So for me, I'm like, if, if they could do this, how are we ever going to win an election? So I don't know why so many uh, high ranking Republicans are just talking about 2022 and 2024. I'm like, you should be focusing on this. And what's interesting too is yeah. that even some of the bills that were passed, um, like that Georgia law, Trump came out against that law. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's well, uh, that, that's the thing. It's so dysfunctional. The we know Trump, um, and this is kind of the, the 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 social politics of it too. Trump has a grudge against brian kemp um and it stems all the way back to last year when brian kemp actually opened georgia up we were the first state to open back in last summer Uh, trump didn't like it and so he started hammering kemp on it as well i think that's why you're seeing i think that's why you're seeing vernon vernon jones run is because um trump has pushed him out there as a primary to brian kemp and even people in georgia are not really fond on on Kemp either because I mean he just got booed off stage last week by a bunch of Republicans. (laughs) Uh, Well that's the thing is like um, when I talk about that I really don't want Trump to run again I'm it's just starting to come out now uh, and I really I'm happy about that because I I thought it wouldn't be for years that we would find out the fraud that took place with the lockups and COVID and all of that but it's starting Mm -hmm. to come out now. Um, uh, Trump did nothing to stand up to the lockdowns and the masks and the COVID tyranny. And I understand that he was in a politically impossible situation. However, he's always been at his absolute worst when he tries to be political. His response to Charlottesville, that got so messed up because he was trying to be political and please everyone and he pleased no one. So I'm at the moment, I'm all about DeSantis 2024. I think I think yeah. that regardless of whether he runs or not, I think the Republican Party has a lot that they can learn from DeSantis in that he is actually um, using the power of the government and legislation to protect people's rights. And that's something yeah. that a lot of Republicans have not had the balls to do. They just talk small government, small government. Well, that's great, but the government is gargantuan right now. So how about while it is, we utilize the power of big government against itself? Which which makes sense. And, but 
you know, when you've seen enough election cycles um, as a Republican, you see somebody like Ron DeSantis come out, there have been a number of DeSantis's over the years. And I mean, we're three years away from another election. So his he, he he's peaking almost too early, I think. I mean, that's the way that politics kind of works. But the other thing with Republicans, Republicans are so... Republicans have been lied to by the establishment Republicans for so long. Um, I mean, I, I was I was a member of the Tea Party and everything like that when all that was going on. Um, and we were all about small government, small government, you know, get, you know, no universal health care. You know, we would ban and replace um, Obamacare and all that. And all that they would tell us is we don't have any power. Um, you have to give us um, the Congress and the White House. And what happened? We gave them the Congress and the White House, and they still really didn't do anything <laughs> except yep. for grow government even more. We got tax cuts, but they were they were minuscule tax cuts, what they should have been. I'm so um, over that where I I swear to God, I yes, it's important or whatever, but I, if Republicans never talk, say tax cuts again, I'll be thrilled. Like, <laughs> yeah. they, there are just these were these buzzwords that they've been using since before I was born: socialism, big government, tax cuts. Enough. The average person doesn't even understand the meaning of these things because Republicans have never made any effort to educate the public. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in 2008 and what was it? 12, 2008 and 2012, it was that was the biggest issue was taxes. And it was um, all about Republicans wanting flat taxes, you know, 10 percent tax flat. And and that in 2016, that completely went away. Um, and, and, and they kind of started taking tax cuts and all that stuff kind of off the table. And um, they didn't even really talk about more tax cuts at this last election. Well, Democrats were talking about raising taxes. Yeah. I mean, I feel like they didn't run on a whole lot of anything this last election, at least no. in terms of his campaign. No. A lot of Republicans have been doing that. I've seen a lot of uh, conservatives kind of coming out, uh, asking what's up with all these ads and stuff like this, these ads for people that are running that have absolutely no substance. It's Democrat bad. That strategy My, uh... has never worked. It's never worked. The, they see that it worked for Biden, and that was it. That's the first time it's ever worked, and they think it's going to work for them. It's not. And it worked for Biden. Like I'd put a little asterisk. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but um, no, my friend uh, Olivia, I don't know if you know Olivia Ronda, she's amazing, but um, she talks about that all the time that like she'll post yep. these uh, commercials of people running and they're talking about AOC yep. and they're running in like Alaska and their whole life yep. is about AOC. That's absolutely, I think that's who I, I've seen it from. Yeah, I do <laughs> follow her. So, um, but then. And then the one ad I remember with the one ad that I that she, that she had posted and I looked at, I was like, wait, this is just the Kim Classic uh, ad with you, mm-hmm. like walking through the city. That's that's yep. you just like repurpose that. Ad. <laughs> yeah. It, it, and that's the thing, too, is I can say as somebody who was who had basically a front row seat of the inside yeah. stuff is on every level it is the worst people being put forward it's the turning point usa types who get a seat at the table who the yeah. the party is so infected so deeply infected that it just needs to be totally taken over from the ground up on every level from every yeah. school board to everything um that's always something that drives me crazy is like i swear to god if i see one more video from charlie kirk that's like four or five years old to conceal the fact that they aren't doing anything i mean heard what you say they get 30 million dollars a year for activism where's the activism like as somebody who was traveling the whole country it, during 2020 where are any of these people who are just pushed forward and pushed forward and promoted by the republican party but don't actually do anything yeah, absolutely. Um, well, and then, yeah, the GOP keeps putting out these garbage candidates that, that don't do anything either. I was not surprised. And when I looked at the numbers, I knew we were going to lose both Senate seats in Georgia. Before the election, I knew we were going to lose both Senate seats. Yeah. And, and because you look at David Perdue, and David Perdue has a worse voting record than AOC in terms of the Constitution. Wow. That's not the person you should be running. 
you know, and but then you look at the numbers and Shane Hazel pulled more Democrat votes than uh, Joe Jorgensen did, you wow. know, because all you have to do is look at the top of the ticket and look at look at um, look at the middle, you know, they're they're part of the ticket. No, um, and a lot of people, um, you know, just like some of the things I'm saying right now, a lot of people on Twitter sort of flip out when I say shit like this. They do not want to hear any introspection. Um, another thing is I live in New York. I live AOC's <laughs> district starts a block away from me. So they don't want to hear this, but I feel like when somebody is successful, you have to look at what is appealing about them, why they are successful, why yeah. people voted for her. And that's another thing that they don't want to hear. I'll tell you, as somebody who was here before anyone knew who she was, I would constantly see her in the neighborhood, knocking on doors, handing out flyers. I wish to God that my party would put a tenth of the effort in that she has. Like, I'll say that begrudgingly, yeah. but credit where it's due. Um, yeah. There are no Republicans here. And I was having this conversation with somebody who lives near me recently um, where she's starting to wake up a little bit about this stuff, but she's still sort of a Democrat. So I was talking about all the local things that have happened, how horrible it is with de Blasio, with Cuomo, with all of that. And she was like, okay, fine. So I, tell me who to vote for then. Who do I vote for here? And I couldn't tell her. That is such a problem that like <laughs> somebody who is as deeply into politics as I am, who has no friggin' life other than this, other than me, <laughs> and I still can't tell you what the name of one local Republican that's running because they do nothing. They don't show up in these areas. They don't put, put in the work. They don't try to educate people. And it is maddening. It's easier yeah. to just sit and go, oh, AOC, AOC, AOC. Well, you do something then. Yeah. And, and, and I think part of it, too, is people need to see, too, sometimes you win more with carrots because there's sometimes where I agree with AOC. And I always say, I can't believe I'm saying this, but AOC's she's right. Like, this is exactly the right way to look at it, because she's one of the few that has hammered Joe Biden, even on the detention centers and stuff like that. At the, at the southern border she's consistent at least in, in well, a lot of ways and it's okay. now. <laughs> tear, tear. Dab, dab. oh absolutely um but it's, it's just frustrating that there's still yeah. i feel like has not been any sort of change in the this has not been a wake-up call to people they're still it's like they would rather sit around bitching about oh should they be for gay marriage or not gay marriage gives a shit it was a fucking decade ago like are you kidding me can we live in this century this decade god absolutely i well and that's the thing so talk about people that are socially conservative um marjorie taylor green's district is about a block from my house so oh wow we have like this <laughs> different... <laughs> we got crazy but from both sides yeah <laughs> <laughs> Hey, but I did want to ask you, so how long have you been into politics and what got you into politics? Um, I, so I've been in politics or I've been interested in politics since I was probably like 16, 17. Um, this is mortifying to say, but I think what got me into politics was watching Bill Maher when I was a teenager. I used to love him. <laughs> um which you know he's yeah, <laughs> yeah he is what he is but it's sort of like that was my gateway drug into the rest of it um no I was just really into all that and then um in 2008 I like volunteered for Obama and stuff young and stupid um yeah and then it was probably around I don't know it was like the 2010s 2012 2015 all that when I started when my mind slowly started changing um away from the left but then i didn't even become a republican until a year or two ago yeah. so i there was a period of time where like i was like okay i'm definitely not a leftist or a democrat anymore but trump and the right sort of had to also convince me yeah absolutely i get that um i mean that is kind of you see the same pattern with a lot of the, the people that have walked away from the left all the prominent people you ariel and and the like it's all like there's this process where they're like you know i don't agree with the left i'm not on the left anymore but i'm also not necessarily ready to dip my toe into the into the republican party right yeah. um and i still like i'm not a conservative i'm definitely a republican and want them to win but i'm not a conservative sort of um you know there are issues where i learned a lot more that i didn't know 
But on big things, sort of, I, uh, my views didn't change. The parties changed in terms of being anti-war yeah. and civil liberties and free speech. All of that, the parties basically just shifted so much. Yeah. Yeah, and for the most part, both major parties aren't, I mean, aren't anti-war anymore. You know, Donald Trump was the first person to even really talk about bringing the troops home um, yeah. and stuff like that. And the first person that actually did anything about it, at least at the end of his, his term. Um, no, he was great on that. And that's what makes it so yeah. hard to try and find the next person because Trump represents such an odd mix of characteristics in terms of policy that, that are very difficult to find in anyone else. You might find one person or two people who represent some of them, like maybe they're good with yeah. one thing, but they're a war hawk or they're good with foreign policy, but they pander to the woke shit. So it's very hard to find someone who, you know, ticks all of those boxes. Yeah. And I mean, even us in the Libertarian Party, we're the same way. Um, it's like libertarians will jump ship. You don't meet all their perfect candidate requirements, um, which is which is why they can't get any traction and stuff like that, because libertarians just won't vote sometimes. Um, and, and, and it's and it's crazy. But I would I mean, I would rather see more libertarian republicans and vote for them than the libertarian party sometimes you know oh yeah i support the party growing and getting third parties i wish we had i wish we had four parties you know i wish aoc and bernie would start their own party and move away from the democrats and then the libertarian party would start gaining followers as well because then you have four major parties that have very distinct values um where then the democrats and republicans would almost be obsolete because they're almost the same yeah i i Personally, though, I mean, I don't really think that Bernie Sanders and AOC are really that different than the Democrats. Like, I think the party is just bent to their will. Um, and I think for me, that in terms of trying to get people to vote for Trump, that I feel like is the biggest mistake that I made in thinking that liberals would care about the things that they claim to care about in terms of Joe Biden's record, that he was one of the architects of the war on drugs and mass incarceration and supported every war of the last half century. So I th I was thinking, oh, I'll educate them about his record, and then they'll be like, oh wow, what is my mind has changed? But no, they, their words mean nothing. They don't give a damn. So yeah, that's that's absolutely true. It doesn't mean anything. I mean, politicians lie. Like I said, I mean, I heard the same thing from Republicans for years and years and years, and then they just never do anything well when they when they get what they've told you that they needed to to make changes, and it, it just keeps going the same. And so that's why, you know, politics are so hard to, you know, see a path forward when you, when you don't see change happening for, for, for so many years. Um, but um, so you guys know that the, the walkway movement was doing something right when, when you, when you got Antifa coming after you, right? How was oh, yeah. that? <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Um, it's thought, just an idea though, like right? What's that? I said Antifa is just an idea, though, right? Oh yeah, yeah, it's just an idea with their fists in your face. They they <laughs> yeah. they had to lock down our hotel because of an idea. Yeah, there was an idea, an idea. That bomb threat. <laughs> um, no, we were uh, chased by them and picked by them so many times. My favorite though was the first event we ever did. So uh, me and Brandon Blair uh, have our LGBT town hall that we've done a bunch of times. They're amazing. We did a live debate too. I'm oh, I'm so excited to do more. I, I can't wait until we get to a place where we can move forward. Um, but my favorite thing was our first event we did. It was the LGBT Town Hall, and it blew up into this huge shit storm. The venue canceled us, all this stuff. So as our people in the audience were waiting to get into the building, there was this long line going around the block. And across the street, Antifa was picketing us. So um, they start screaming, like, trans lives matter trans lives matter and it's funny because like maybe half the people online are transgender so they yeah. started screaming that back at antifa they're like we agree we agree and you could just see the sparks over the antifa people's heads flying we're like what yeah because you guys i mean they were like right in your face i remember the video watching you guys like that was that was intense they're psychotic. They, a lot of these, in a lot of these instances, they probably don't even really know who we are. They just, they definitely didn't in terms of when we left the White House and we got stopped by a mm -hmm. couple people. They just 
assumed from what we were wearing that we had been there, but they don't know who we are. They don't know what we believe. They don't know anything in yeah. many more ways than one. But um, they're a psychotic, violent cult. Democrats won't say a word about it. They've been allowed to just run our streets and do whatever the hell they want. There's no opposition. It's insane. No, absolutely. Um, and it's not even that the Democrats stuck to fires, right? Like Maxine oh, Waters and stuff like that. And and then and then we will talk about January sixth, right? I'm just gonna say that. That and that's why I don't give a damn about January sixth. Look, yeah, was it stupid? Absolutely. Like that's the thing is that the left is always very strategic in their activism. The right never is, unfortunately. And you know, the whole time that I've been doing this, I've always said don't give people the gun to shoot you with. Well, that's exactly what the right did. We gave them the gun to shoot us with. There was such yeah. a chain reaction. So it was dumb and stupid and ill-conceived and moronic in a million ways. However, after we've had entire cities burning for almost a year, after we've had $2 billion in property damage, uh, almost 30 deaths, hundreds of police officers injured, uh, people who lost their livelihoods and their businesses, I don't want to hear it that, oh, they broke a couple windows. If you think I give a damn, you're wrong. Like, it's crazy. Um, right. And I mean, we're supposed to act like, oh, the darkest day in American history. It's ridiculous. And I think the most important yeah. point about this is that for six months beforehand, for entire six months, it was the powerless who were being attacked. It was the it was the lower and middle yeah. class Americans who were having their businesses burned to the ground. How, however, when it attacks, when it impacts the powerful for one afternoon, then it's the darkest day in American history. Yeah, that's exactly what I said about the whole thing, because I am very consistent when it came to violence of any means, of whether it's Antifa or the right. Um, I can I, I condemned what happened on January 6th but I also said if I'm looking at it though at least they went after the people that are oppressing you oppressing yep. us and not individual businesses just trying to make their lives and destroying their own neighborhoods essentially you know people and of course neighbors. obviously anyone who committed any violent acts should be you know held responsible as to the fullest extent but yeah you're absolutely yeah. right so I guess that's a good segue and to talk about Brandon's situation then now too, right? So yeah. how is he doing? Um, because for those of you that don't know, Brandon was arrested because he was on the steps of the Capitol. Now, he, ne he said he never went into the, into the building, never. right? Never. So he was arrested a few months ago, right? Um, yeah. And how is that going? And, and uh, you know, how are his spirits and everything like that too? He's amazing. He is the strongest person I know. He's, you know, he, he hasn't been able to be out there in front and on social media and doing stuff, but he's been working so hard behind the scenes. They've been working on a million things and are building their own platform, their own payment processing thing. So they're really going to basically create the model for how right-leaning people should handle being deplatformed in the future. Um, it's really going to yeah. be one of the first instances of somebody fighting back in a meaningful way. Um, so he's doing amazing and is really hanging in there. And, um, you know, I feel very confident that this is going to be behind us very soon. So yeah. things are moving forward with it. And, you know, it, I can't and wait until it's just in the past because he did absolutely nothing wrong. It is yeah. a travesty what's happening to him. Um, you know? Yeah, so, um, I mean, are you guys... Is there a plan right now for you guys to get back out there and start traveling again? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, first things first, uh, you know. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm just really looking forward for this to be behind him. Absolutely. He's got, he's got a, I mean, he's got to finish that first, but then, yeah, you guys, you guys get back out there and really, um, I mean, obviously next year is a big year for a lot of, a lot of the states because it's a midterm year so um it'll be just as important to get you guys out there but again we got to make sure that those candidates even want you platforming from because you don't want to be platforming candidates that are are pushing people away like people in the movement as well no it's ridiculous i mean 
just in New York, it drives me crazy over the past year. I, I, you know, I think we're now finally at a point where people realize just how heinous Cuomo and de Blasio are, but New Yorkers are offered no alternative. Like there has been such a massive opportunity in front of the Republican party in New York this last year, and they've done nothing with it. This is such an opportunity to get out there and speak to people, go to the neighborhoods where they live, explain to them what's happening, offer an alternative vision, give people a reason to vote for you. And they don't do any of that. It's crazy. And people forget the fact that just in my lifetime in New York City, we've had Republican mayors, governors, senators. But then at a certain point, the Republican Party decided to just wash their hands of it and concede the biggest city in the country to the radical left. It's horrible. You know, if they think that it's going to be any different, sure, de Blasio can't run again, but we're just going to get the same shit repackaged, remarketed, and people will vote for him. Yeah, Whoever it is, the same damn thing. And and a lot of voters, and, and a lot of voters are not really into politics as much. You know, they um they just see a letter next to a name and they say that's who I'm gonna vote for because that's what they've always done. Um, and so that's where you absolutely have to get out there and say, this is what's, what they're doing. And this is what we plan because it's not just good enough to say, this is why this person's bad. You have to say, this is why you should vote for us because this is the platform that they're doing, but this is our solution to the same problems. Yeah. Um, you have to, sh- you have to give them alternate solutions. Um, and, and they, that's they what they're not do doing now with the fraud that has taken place, the con that has taken place amongst us over the last year, if they can't now, then when? I mean, people are really sick of this, I think, but they're just not offered any meaningful alternative. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. There's, there's, Republicans are running garbage candidates and then um, the two party system is suppressing I mean, the duopoly, they, they suppress the libertarian uh, platform uh, to it heavily. So it's not even like you could get, say, hey, let's run a libertarian here because it's they're just suppressing it. Um, j- and then the media doesn't like either one. So they're just going to run everything for Democrats. And that's right. what you're fighting. You're fighting a heavy, a heavy bias media as well. Oh, beyond. I mean, did you see that clip with uh, Brian Stelter? where uh, he said he was interviewing the press secretary and was like, what does the media get wrong? How can we help? I'm like, imagine them saying that to Trump. Oh my God. No, they wouldn't. They would never. That's the thing is they would never. I mean, you see it in the Fauci emails and just like, it's, it's the media is complicit in one of the biggest conspiracies in, in, in this, in this country when it comes to the Fauci emails. But think about having an advisor that tells you something like masks don't work, you go out there and push that to the country. And then the next day the, the, that advisor goes out and says, no, he's absolutely wrong. You take this advisor over the president's word and that's the stuff you're pushing. Like, no, the president's wrong and everything like this. And, and I think, I mean, I saw the other day, somebody said Fauci's got blood in his hands because he, he really does. When you're talking about masks and stuff like that, the reason why these mask states have so many cases compared to the unmasked states is because those masks didn't work and they gave people a false sense of security. And so they weren't worried about, you know, social distancing and everything like that. They weren't, you know, so that's why their numbers were a lot higher. They, they, they really didn't do what they were supposed to do. And it it really hurt a lot of people. And what about these people who work in retail that are forced to wear it day after day after day, all day long. Nobody will ever convince me as long as I live that being like this all day, every day is healthy, breathing in your own air. No, no. And you know, I I will never wear that fucking thing again as long as I live. I'll wear it on planes because unless somebody can tell me an alternative, I don't know, Um, but that's it. 
if an Uber tells me I can't wear it, I'll get out and take another. Like, and that's what people need to do. That's what is so frustrating about, yeah. you know, that's a big realization, unfortunately, that I've come to over the last few months is that the destruction of America will not be because of the left. It will be because of the cowardice of the right that we cannot, we are so inept and so cowardly that we cannot even stand up for something as small as that, breathing fresh air. If there were a, you know, people like to reframe this issue always is, oh, private business, they can do what they want. Sure. However, if there were a cost to that, if they would lose money and lose business and there was a steep penalty for them requiring people to walk around like this all the time, then this would be done with long ago. But yeah. oh, nobody yeah. wants yeah. to do that. It is so few the number of people who will really take a stand against these masks, unfortunately. Like, so yeah. I just think we need to become a whole lot bolder and more empowered and who cares what people call you yeah i agree i mean we don't have that issue as much down here obviously um okay. yeah i haven't worn a mask in months but i i mean i shoot i went to the baseball game on friday or saturday and i saw maybe two masks the whole whole stadium so uh, i was out yesterday it it is 92 degrees here so i went out for the day with some friends at least 50% of people, probably way more, were wearing masks outside. Uh, these freaks, yeah. it's crazy. Yeah, Insane. and I am I am one of those people that would say that I, I respected a you know business's um, decision to be able to do it. But I know a lot of people who, if, the, if a business required a mask, they would not go there, you know, stuff That's like amazing. that. That's amazing. I don't know anyone like that around here. <laughs> well, yeah, in, in a city like New York, you're not going to you're not going to see it as much. But I've always advocated, even for like the trans bathroom issue, I believe that individual businesses can run their business however they want. And the market will decide it'll, it'll hit them in the pocketbook, you know, see, with the trans bathroom issue. I feel like that's just another non issue that the yeah. two parties use as if we don't have real problems. I mean, you know, trans people have been going to the bathroom for all all of time this was never a friggin' problem until the yeah. both parties decided to make it one you know i think that yeah. it's a different issue when it comes to things like self-identification and locker rooms and all that that's different yeah. but in terms of bathrooms it is just the stupidest non-issue yeah self-id is not a good thing but you're absolutely right and it and 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 you just hit the nail on the head too when it when it came as how this how this all kind of came about um, remember it was 2015, mm -hmm. yeah, about 2015 time frame. Um, and Democrats decided that they wanted to essentially create a solution to a problem there wasn't there yet. And so they passed, so Charlotte passed the uh the open bathrooms act basically. And then of course, and this is where Republicans of uh, Republicans are suckers for taking bait like this, uh -huh. right? This is exactly why Republicans have an issue is because they knew exactly what they were going to do. And as soon as Charlotte did that, they passed HB1 in North Carolina. I lived in North Carolina at the time. I was, in, uh, I was at Fort Bragg at the time. And they, and it just went crazy. And it's like they passed HB, HB1, and then all the boycotts happened of, of North Carolina and everything like that. And it was like, this is such a non-issue. Like we have a lot more important things to, to worry about. Um, and like you said, trans people have been using the bathrooms that they identify with. I hate that word identify. I don't even use it. Yeah. No, I totally <laughs> but, agree with you. I, um, yeah, there was this thing that I was interviewed for from this, uh, like left this media thing years ago. And they were like, how do you identify I was like, I don't identify as gay. I just am. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I tell people too. I'm like, I, I, I hate using that word because it makes it seem like it's, it's a choice, you know? Yeah. And that's what I've always said. No, but that really is uh, the view now of the alphabet industry is that sexuality yeah. is a choice. Absolutely, there was an article, absolutely. I did a video about this maybe like a year or a year and a half ago, but there was this article in NBC News uh, saying about how all these celebrities, they're choosing to not be straight. And the writer openly said, uh, sexuality is a choice and you should choose to not be heterosexual. And this is the problem with being heterosexual. So choose differently. So that really is their view nowadays. And especially the whole thing yeah. where they say, 
oh, you, you're transphobic if you don't date a trans person. That's telling somebody yeah. that they have a say in who they're attracted and what they're attracted to. No, you're you're absolutely right. And then you have somebody like Milo out there being all crazy. His oh. his interview with Lauren Chen was just like, wow. Oh, I gotta watch that. I love her. Yeah. Go go watch his video with Lauren. I mean, he she is. is brilliant in it because she just lets him talk. And he just makes himself look super crazy. But the I, Republican, oh, or at least at least the alt-right will sit there and and, and love it because they think this is mm-hmm. exactly this is how things work, that it is a choice, that it, you know, with religion, you can save it. And 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 all the stuff that the right has been, or all the stuff that you know liberty-minded people have been fighting against forever the community has been fighting against forever you know what's funny is that i feel like this has sort of been a common thing in my life that like i'll get really into something shitty and it'll be my gateway into better things like when i was a kid there was this band simple plan who who was this like pop punk boy band and i got really into them and that got me into like actual good music same thing with bill maher got me into politics so what kind of really got me into more rightly stuff was Milo yeah. a few years ago. Um, and I hate to say it so much because I, it, the fact that I liked him, and even back then I was like, oh, I don't agree with everything he says and all that. Just the fact that I even would listen to him, I, like I paid a big price for that and lost a million friends and stuff, lost jobs because of it. Um, so it pains me to say this, but I feel like he's really proven people right about him. And yeah. I think he's just such a tragic, to me, he's like a tr- Shakespearean tragic hero, you know? Like, <laughs> he could have been so much more. Because, you know, like, whenever I've hung out with him, and I should say, like, he's always been very nice to me. I just don't like what he's doing in his career right now. But he is just so brilliant. He is so smart and so talented. I wish I was half as smart as he is. And to see what he's using that for now, like he could have been so much more. He could have been somebody who really made an impact on things. Um, yeah. So I, I just think it's really tragic what he's turned into. God, and I'm sorry, like not to be rude, but fucking look at him. Like when did he turn into Joe Exotic? I'm sorry, like if <laughs> this is what being an ex-gay looks like, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Like, he looked so, like the women that he used to rip apart in his audience. <laughs> and, I don't, and I don't mean to, the thing is, the, what I thought was a really positive thing about him when he started and other uh, LGBT people who are more right-leaning is I thought that was a really positive thing uh, for people who maybe weren't very open-minded about gay people or trans people in the past. Like if they have kids that are gay or stuff like that, I thought that could be a really positive thing of them yeah. being accepting and stuff. And I hate to say it, this might sound kind of like lefty, but I feel like him putting on this act of, oh, I'm an ex-gay and I'm choosing to be straight. Like, I feel like there are people who are like hardcore right wing that ha- that inevitably love kids who are gay that watch that and be like, look, he changed, you can change. Like, yeah, I don't absolutely. Think that. I, think that's I mean, that's what that's what I was that's what I was saying earlier. He's kind of getting that that those people over to him, and I think I really think when he he was kind of the one leading the uh, the straight pride last year, right? Yeah. And so that was kind of the beginning of of the demise, I think, after he was, I mean, after he was deplatformed, that was where he, that was like the first thing he did, I think, that really to get, just to gain, to get attention again, to try to, you know, because he's, and, and he's, that's he's, he's can't. When people would say, oh, he's a troll, he's a troll. Well, I, I liked him when he wasn't. Like, that's what I really fell in love with when he would give these like three hour lectures with Christina Hoff Summers. It was amazing. Um, But he's chosen to just be a cartoon character, I guess. I don't know. It's disappointing. Yeah. (laughs) But yeah. All right. So let's rant a little bit about the corporatization of pride. (laughs) And this is the main reason why I'm just done with pride month. I'm just done with it. I'm I'm just done done with it. (laughs) <laughs> it was fun it used to be fun when it was like one day and i would go with friends and we go to the street fair and like you know look at hot guys and sip over price drinks i can't take it anymore now that it's a damn yeah. month and as we said it's more than a month i can't take anymore it's so funny too how you're seeing all of these um side-by-side photos of the rainbow logos here and then every single one in the middle east you won't see any rainbows there yeah. 
yeah, also, absolutely. It's interesting how all of these corporations suddenly take a stand now that we don't need them to, now that it's yeah. accepted and it's the norm. Where were they yeah. in the 1980s when people were dropping dead? I didn't see any Absol rainbow yeah. logos then, did you? No, no. And, huh. and that's the thing is I actually, it, it, it's in the, uh, it's on the promo. Somebody, I screenshotted a, uh, something that somebody put on Twitter and it said, when all of corporate America is pushing your platform and you consider yourself counterculture it's like that's exactly what's going on right yep. now it doesn't make sense i posted a thing of um, all the rainbow corporate logos and was like this is what it looks like to be oppressed marginalized and totally powerless oh absolutely 100 percent. and here's the thing is obviously with most of these corporations it's just pandering they don't really care about this stuff you know i want i i don't mind companies you know if they do this type of stuff year round, but when it's just this one month, it's a little bit different. Cause I mean, I have a clothing line. I have a pride line. In my clothing stuff. <laughs> I mean, I have a clothing line it's, and I have pride stuff and 10% of my, and that's the other thing is 10% of my profits on my pride line go to the Trevor project. Mm -hmm. So if they're, if they're actually, if, if they're actually out there pushing, like putting their money where their mouth is instead of just changing your logo at least like donate some of your profits to to charities that are doing good for the community and stuff like that um there's a cider company up in michigan that one of their drinks year round um everyone that's purchased they they donate to i think the trevor project as well or at least an lgbt community so those companies I don't mind they're just making everybody hate us it's just there i mean there's nothing left in the mainstream LGBT community that stands for any sort of live and let live. Um, yeah. And we said before, the number of LGBT people who voted for Trump doubled this time. So now about one in three LGBT Americans voted for Trump and we are hated and we're shunned and we're not allowed to be yeah. part of anything with them. But it's interesting because that's one in three. I mean, that's a higher proportion than trans people are. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's not 100%. some minuscule minority that supports yeah. this, but you know, they only yeah. want the one image of this radically far left LGBT person. And it's making everybody fucking hate us. I'd hate yeah. us too if I were them. <laughs> I, I, I agree. And that's why people like me, you, Blair, everybody that's out there that you know, we have to show more voices that we are not this monolithic group on the left um, that that the left has portrayed us as and that there's a lot of us out there and that, you know, 25% or whatever you said was is a good example to show that we are a, a silent majority in the community for the most part. Um, you only, I mean, the wokeness is only it's got to be maybe 10% of the community and it, it's just it, allowed 10%. Well, that's how it is with everything is it's a yeah. small minority of the whole country. It's just that they are so powerful and they've been allowed to gain such power in every single institution in every facet of life with no pushback. Um, and that's not something that happened overnight. You know, you could trace it back to the 1990s when yep. these radicals got every associate professorship and now the inmates are running the asylum by this point. Um, Absolutely. In New York, by the way, in New York, they banned police officers from Pride. So yep. I, I don't want to get a group of people to go and like, I don't know, I want to dress up as like <laughs> the cop from the village people or something. Yeah, I think I saw you say that, that would be hilarious. I was actually going to ask if you were planning on going to Pride after they after they banned cops and stuff. Like I that. am. I wasn't going to before that. Now I sure as hell am. And I'll wear... <laughs> something showing my displeasure with it trump hat something i don't care and i want to try to get as many people to come with me as possible so if you're right-leaning lgbt person or straight person whatever and wants to come you're in new york let's go screw these people let's go and have fun and to hell with them absolutely that's a good that's a good way to put it i think that's that's the right way to go uh just be careful security wise and everything like that yeah. because... i can take them I'm working well, out. <laughs> well, I, I'm more worried about something, you know, when you when you eliminate cops from the area after after like the pulse shooting and stuff like that, you start thinking about how are you going to secure an entire event um, without the police? So that that's kind of a scary thought when I when I look at banning police from pride. It's crazy. 
I'm not sure if they ban them from having any sort of crowd control or they ban them from marching in the, I don't know, but either way, like it, yeah. it only hurts LGBT people because I think when police officers are free to be included and march and be open, that is a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful, beautiful yeah. bridge that is built between LGBT people and police officers. And they're the ones who are tearing that bridge down and creating a separation. And that's what they're doing amongst every group. It's, absolutely wherever absolutely. this woke leftist ideology is their destruction follows so yeah i haven't ever really you know it's always been you know sexualization of kids has always been kind of the gripe against the community i've never actually seen it until probably this last year um because we had you know the drag kids and and, and stuff like that and there's always been um, the discussion about kinks are at pride or kids are at pride. And thankfully in Atlanta, um, it's pretty tame down here compared to everywhere else, um, except for the after parties, which I don't care about the after parties. Let's have fun, right? Sh yeah. Be you. Um, so I've never minded kids at pride and stuff like that. I think it's a good thing to show, you know, love is love. But then I just did a reaction video to the Blues Clues Parade um, episode. And there's the BLM fist, which has nothing to do with sexuality. Um, it's talking, it, but the biggest thing I, I had an issue with, with it talking, um, one of the ones talks about ace and exactly. pansexuals. The way I reacted was why are like that is teaching kids specifically about sexualization the message should be you know men and can love men women can love women and these people can transition but when you start talking about asexual you're talking about their sexuality you can be a bi asexual you can be a gay asexual you can be a lesbian asexual but you're talking about a phys the physical aspect of sex and kids don't need to even know about that you know they just need to know that these two people love each other and it's okay and it's a good thing um love is love no matter what but that's they pushed it now so far past that boundary that it's starting to be like why why are you doing this i, I my my view has always been too is if you're if you have a fairy tale or something like that and you have a gay couple in a fairy tale if you're upset at that, then you should also be upset at having straight couples in a fairy tale because it's the same thing. Um, but when you're talking actual sexuality, it, it, it absolutely gets to be, it's wrong. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, I, so also, by the way, in New York, I, I was wondering if it was just me, but like, you know, I've been going to the Pride Parade many years. I've never seen, so when people talk about, oh, kinky shit and all this, I, it, it, maybe it's in other cities. I wouldn't know, but there's not, that's not really what happens here. Like it's yeah. mostly like banks promoting themselves, wine moms, like it, it's really not that big of a deal. And it, it's again, yeah. like you said perfectly before about conservatives taking the bait, like they're so focused on this one day a year. I don't give a damn. It's one day, you know, if people want to like even go wild one day, great. I am much more yeah. concerned with the fact that LGBT people are poisoning ourselves the other 364 days of the year. That's what I care about. If it were yeah. just one day a year that they were crazy, great. Have at it. Um, so yeah, no, I agree. In terms of the other shit, it's psychotic, all of the stuff that's happening when they're, you know, they're talking about asexuals as if kids are going to know what that, I, you know, I, I'm an yeah. old man. I don't know what the hell it means. I'm pretty sure it's just like a hormonal <laughs> imbalance, but um, it's crazy. I, I've always kind of disagreed with where they say like that the reasoning for this is sexual, that they're grooming children and stuff. Now, is it sexualizing children? 100%. Absolutely. But I truly don't think that that's their intention. I think they just think that this is a good thing. I think what it is, is it's the ideological indoctrination of children, that this is their way of bringing them into this cult ideology, um, which is equally nefarious. Um, but yeah, well, that's absolutely what it is when you add the black and brown stripes to the flag. That is talking you know th that's the full ideology and then you add the blm fist on there that's completely talking and and subconsciously subverting them to marxist ideology and stuff like that in kids shows it's crazy and it's and it's 
becoming so common. Every friend of mine who has a young child that's in kindergarten or first grade, every single one, every single one of them tells me that there's at least one or two or three kids in the class who are transgender, they're transitioning, they're non-binary and all this shit. It's crazy. Um, and so when you said about um, having gay characters and kids stuff, I wouldn't have cared about that. I would have thought that was a wonderful thing a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. But I think the problem today, at least for me, is that you see the agenda. You see that it's not it's not happening organically. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's not. Again, it's not just teaching to be accepting of of LGBT people. It is pushing it onto them like this is something that you should be looking at identify you know being you know coming out as this as a child it's like oh i want to be like that I, I get the messaging like you said i don't think they're doing some people some of them aren't doing it maliciously i think they want to absolutely um, just teach acceptance but that's not what's happening in real life in culture right now no it's crazy it's just it's too damn much it's crazy if kids ask, you know, when I was a little kid, I remember when I found out what gay was, we were watching an episode of The Nanny with me and my parents, and they said, like, oh, I'm gay or something. I was like, what's gay? And they were like, uh, some boys like boys, some boys like girls, some people don't like that. We, it, we love everyone in this house, and none of this is of any concern to you until you are older and make up your own mind. And that is all kids yeah. need to know. That is it. Yep. No, no, you're abs you're absolutely right. And that's why I, I don't mind them showing it. I don't like mind them showing it, but because I think that that's the type of conversation that they should be pushing out there. And that's what they should be talking to kids about. But that's not what's going on anymore. That's think, what it was. Oh, oh, for ahead. me, I feel like even them showing it gives me such a negative reaction now because you yes. know what the reason for that is. Um, it's the same way with when I was in kindergarten. They, the teacher opened up a white egg and opened up a brown egg to show us, oh, we're all the same on the inside. That's what you should be teaching kids when it comes to all yeah. of this shit. I, I really wish that there could be some experiment done where you take two groups of kids and, of multiracial backgrounds and one of them, you teach them our differences are beautiful. We have different skin colors. We're all equal. It doesn't matter. Your race is as irrelevant as the color of your eyes. You can do anything you want. And then let's take the other <laughs> group of kids and teach them critical race theory and teach them intersectionality. We'll tell the white kids that they're privileged. We'll tell the black kids that they're victims. And let's see in which of the two groups racism flourishes. Let's see which of them is harmonious and gets along and which of them causes nothing but dysfunction and hatred and segregation. Because I know exactly which group that would be. Yeah, I think we all, I think we all kind of know which one that would be. <laughs> all of this stuff, it is so pervasive, the stuff that they're doing with kids, especially with all the alphabet shit. And what's funny is like, I don't even like kids. Like I find them fucking annoying. I can't stand kids. So I'm like, if I care about this, why don't you people, why don't people who actually <laughs> care about like the well-being of children? I know. That, I mean, that makes sense. <laughs> they should, because it really does. Even if you, if, even if you don't like it, it's going to affect culture later, right? I mean, we know that there's a whole generation of kids that were given participation trophies, and now they're in college, and look what's happening. <laughs> oh, and it's funny because for years people said, "Oh, wait until these kids get into the real world." Rude awakening. Nope hasn't happened the real world has bent to their will yeah and if they haven't they just go destroy buildings <laughs> <laughs> they throw yep. tantrums yeah that's that's really what it is they're just gonna throw tantrums i'm so over the but table. but it was so nice to have you on it's so, so you're relaunching you. what's that I, I miss you too i'm gonna come up to new york and hang out with you and ariel and it's gonna be so much fun yes. Do it, do I don't it, do know it, if it's it. gonna be the, I don't know if it's gonna be this year because I'm having surgery in November, but yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna I'm I'm definitely gonna come up and hang out at some point. Um, I'm uh, I'm moving hopefully next month, so you can come stay with me. That's perfect. That's why I actually made that comment to you when you showed the pictures of your new place. I'm like, oh, no, it's got room for me to come stay. Yes, of course. <laughs> That'd be perfect. Um, and then you're relaunching your YouTube channel, right? So I am. I, uh, you know, after traveling so much and being 
so up to my ass in politics and the outcome and the sixth and all that I my mental health was really just shot after all of that so I've sort of been adhering to the Jordan Peterson kind of principle of like fix yourself before you worry about fixing the world so that's what I've been <laughs> yeah. working on mostly the past couple months um but now I'm ready to uh, have my comeback. So yeah, I'm relaunching my YouTube channel in the next couple of weeks, trying to figure out the exact date, but and I'm going to be launching like locals and Patreon and a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Um, I think somewhat my friend convinced me to get on friggin' TikTok. So I don't really get the point of it. I'm kind of too old for it. I don't know what to do on there. I don't dance. Yeah. I don't have a talent. I don't know, but I'm launching a bunch of stuff. So <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah. And I will put your, uh, your links in the comments below. Yes. Follow um, me on my stuff, the Twitter and the Instagram. <laughs> I'm there. Yeah. And make sure you guys subscribe to this channel. Um, subscribe to Sarah. We love her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we will be back um, with another channel next week. We've got a bunch of great guests coming up. So um, glad to have you guys here. Thanks, Mike. Love you.